Magic Shoes, hello! Hi, I'm Josh, and this is my face, and this is a book, and we are live, it's 8 o'clock. It's time for chapter 10, yeah, chapter 10 of Rinkitink in Oz. Rinkitink in Oz. Uh, last night, we met, uh, what was her name? Zella, the girl who now has the magic shoes. She's got the, she's got Prince Inga's shoes with the blue pearl and the pink pearl. And she's incredibly strong and can't be hurt by anything. But she doesn't know it. Or, well, she doesn't know why. She knows bees won't sting her. So I guess that's a thing. Tonight it is time for Chapter 10, The Cunning of Queen Kaw. Let's begin. Chapter 10. You may be sure the Queen of Corygos was not well pleased to have King Gos and all his warriors living in her city after they had fled from their own. They were savage-natured and quarrelsome men at all times, and their tempers had not impressed since their conquest by the Prince of Pingaree. Moreover, they were eating up the Queen, up queen Kor's provisions and, crown, and crowding the houses of her own people, who grumbled and complained until their queen was heartily tired. "'Shame on you,' she said to her husband, King Gos. "'Gos, to be driven out of your city by a boy, a roly-poly king, and a billy goat. "'Why do you not go back and fight them?' "'No human can fight against the power of magic,' returned the king to, in a surly voice. "'That boy is either a fairy or under the protection of fairies. "'We escaped with our lives only because we were quick to run away. "'But should we return to Regos, "'this same terrible power that burst open the city gates "'would crush us all to atoms.' "'Bah! You are a coward!' cried the queen tauntingly. "'I am not a coward!' said the big king. I have killed in battle scores of my enemies by the might of my sword and by my good right arm. I have conquered many nations all my life. People have feared me. But no one would dare face the tremendous power of the Prince of Pingari, boy, though he is. It would not be courage. It would be folly to attempt it. Then meet his power with cunning suggested the queen. Take my advice and steal over to Rigos at night when it is dark and capture or destroy the boy while he sleeps. No weapon can touch his body, was the answer. He bears a charmed life and cannot be injured. Does the fat king possess magic powers? Or the goat? inquired Kor. I think not, said Gos. We could not injure them, indeed, any more than we could the boy. But they did not seem to have any unusual strength, although the goat's head is harder than the battering ram. Well, mused the queen, there is surely some way to conquer that slight boy. If you are afraid to undertake the job, I shall go myself. By some stratagem, I shall manage to make him my prisoner. He will not dare defy a queen, and no magic can stand against a woman's cunning. <coughs> go ahead, if you like, replied the king with an evil grin, and if you are hung up by the thumbs or cast into a dungeon will serve you right for thinking you can succeed what a skilled warrior does not dare make an attempt. I'm not afraid, answered the queen. It only It is only soldiers and bullies who are cowards. In spite of this assertion, Queen Cole was not so brave as she was cunning. For several days she thought over this plan and that, and decided to, and tried to decide what which was the most likely to, to succeed. She had never seen the boy prince, but had heard so many tales of him from the defeated warriors, and especially from Captain Buzzub, that she had learned to respect his power. Spurred on by the knowledge that she would never get rid of her unwelcome guests until Prince Inga was overcome and Regos regained for Queen Ghost, or for... I'm sorry, my face is having a hard time with words. Regos regained for King Ghost. The queen of Corygos finally decided to trust to luck and her native wits to defeat a simple-minded boy, however powerful he might be. Inga could not suspect what she was going to do because she did not know herself. She intended to act boldly and trust to chance to win. It is evident that had the cunning queen known that Inga had lost all his magic, she would not have devoted so much time to the simple matter of capturing him. But like all others... She was impressed by the marvelous exhibition of power he had shown in, in capturing Regos, and had no reason to believe the boy was less powerful now. One morning, Queen Kor boldly entered a boat, and, 
taking four men with her as an escort and a bodyguard, was rowed across the narrow channel to Rigos. Prince Inga was sitting in the palace playing checkers with King Rinkatink when a servant came to him, saying that Queen Kor had arrived and desired an audience with him. With many misgivings, lest the wicked queen discover that he had now lost his magic powers, the boy ordered her to be admitted, and she soon entered the room and bowed low before him, in mock respect. Kor was a big woman, almost as tall as King Gos. She had flashing black eyes and the dark complexion you see on gypsies. Her, you can't say that. You can't say that anymore. It's ter- I'm sorry. Sometimes I read things that were written in the 1910s, and I'm like, oh. Her temper, when irritated, was something dreadful, and her face wore an evil expression which she tried to cover by smiling sweetly, often when she meant the most mischief. "'I have come,' said she in a low voice, "'to render homage to the noble Prince of Pingaree. I am told that your highness is the strongest person in the world, and invincible in battle, and therefore I wish you to become my friend rather than my enemy.' Now Inga did not know how to reply to this speech. He disliked the appearance of the woman and was afraid of her, and he was unused to deception and did not know how to mask his real feelings. So he took time to think over his answer, which he finally made in these words. I have no quarrel with your majesty, and my only reason for coming here is to liberate my father and mother, and my people whom you and your husband have made your slaves, and to recover the goods King Gauls has plundered from the island of Pingaree. This is I, this I hope to soon accomplish, and if you really wish to be my friend, you can assist me greatly. While he was speaking, Queen Kor had been studying the boy's face stealthily from the corners of her eyes, and she said to herself, He is so small and innocent that I believe I can capture him alone, and with ease. He does not seem very terrible. <laughs> <coughs> he does not seem very terrible, and I suspect King Gos and his warriors were frightened of nothing. Then aloud she said to Inga, I wish to invite you, mighty prince, and your friend, the great king of Gilgad, to my poor palace at Corrigos, where all my people shall do you honor. Will you come? At present, replied Inga uneasily, I must refuse your kind invitation. There will be feasting and dancing girls and games and fireworks, said the queen, speaking as if eager to entice him, and at each word coming a step nearer to where he stood. I could not enjoy them while my poor parents are slaves, said the boy sadly. Are you sure of that? asked Queen Ko, and by that time she was close beside Inga. Suddenly she leaned forward and threw both of her long arms around Inga's body, holding him in a grasp that was like a vice. Now Rinkatink sprang forward to rescue his friend, but Kor kicked out viciously with her foot and struck the king squarely on his stomach, a very tender place to be kicked, especially if one is fat. Then, still hugging Inga tightly, the queen called aloud, I've got him! Bring in the ropes! Instantly, the four men she had brought with her sprang into the room and bound the boy hand and foot. Next, they seized Rinkatink, who was still rubbing his stomach, and bound him likewise. With a laugh of wicked triumph, King Queen Kor now led her captives down to the boat and returned with them to Corrigos. Great was the astonishment of King Gos and his warriors when they saw that the mighty Prince of Pingaree, who had put them all to flight, had been captured by a woman. Cowards as they were, they now crowded around the boy and jeered at him, and some of them would have struck him had not the queen cried out, Hands off! He is my prisoner, remember, not yours! Well, Kor, what are you going to do with him? inquired King Gos. I shall make him my slave that he may amuse my idle hours, for he is a pretty boy and gentle, although he did frighten all of you big warriors so terribly. The king scowled at this speech, not liking to be ridiculed, but he said nothing more. He and his men returned that same day to Rigos, after restoring the bridge boats, and they held a wild carnival of rejoicing both in the king's palace and in the city, although the poor people of Rigos were not warriors who were not warriors, were all sorry that the kind young prince had been captured by his enemies and could rule them no longer. When her unwelcome guests had all gone back to Rigos and the queen was alone in her palace, she ordered Inga and Rinkatink brought before her and their bonds removed. They came sadly enough, knowing they were in serious straits, and at the mercy of a cruel mistress. Inga had taken the counsel of the White Pearl, which had advised him to bear up bravely under his misfortune, promising a change for the better very soon. 
With this promise to comfort him, Inga faced the queen with a dignified bearing that indicated both pride and courage. Well, youngster, said she in a cheerful tone because she was pleased with her success. You played a clever trick on my poor husband and frightened him badly. But for that prank, I am inclined to forgive you. Hereafter, I intend you to be my page, which means you must fetch and carry for me at my will. Let me advise you to obey my every whim without question or delay. For when I am angry, I become ugly. And when I am ugly, someone is sure to feel the lash. Do you understand me? Inga bowed, but made no answer. Then she turned to Rinkatink and said, As for you, I cannot decide how to make you useful to me, as you are altogether too fat and awkward to work in the fields. It may be, however, that I can use you as a pincushion. What? cried Rinkatink in horror. Would you stick pins into the king of Gilgad? <clears throat> Why not? returned Queen Cor. You are as fat as a pincushion, you must yourself admit, and whenever I needed a pin, I could call you to me. Then she laughed at his frightened look and asked, By the way, are you ticklish? This was the question Rinkatink had been dreading. He gave a moan of despair and shook his head. I, sh I should love to tickle the bottom of your feet with a feather, continued the cruel woman. Please, take off your shoes. Oh, your majesty, pleaded poor Ringadink, I beg you to allow me to amuse you in some other way. I can dance or I can sing you a song. Well, she answered, shaking with laughter, you may sing a song, if it be a merry one. But you do not seem in a merry mood. I feel merry indeed, your majesty, I do, protested King Rinkatink, anxious to escape the tickling. But even as he professed to feel merry, his round red face wore an expression of horror and anxiety that was really comical. Sing then, commanded Queen Cole, who was greatly amused. Rinkatink gave a sigh of relief, and after clearing his throat and trying to repress his sobs, he began to sing this song gently at first, but finally roaring it out at the top of his voice. Oh, there was a baby tiger in a menagerie. Fizzy, fizzy, fuzzy, they wouldn't set him free, and everybody thought he was as gentle as can be. Fizzy, fizzy, fuzzy, baby tiger. Oh, they patted him upon his head and shook him by the paw. Fizzy, fizzy, fuzzy, he had a bone to gnaw. Uh, but soon he grew the biggest tiger that you ever saw. Fizzy, fizzy, fuzzy, what a tiger. Oh, one day he came to pet the, they came to pet the brute, and he began to fight. Fizzy, fizzy, fuzzy, how he did scratch and bite. He broke the cage, and in a rage he darted out of sight. Fizzy, fizzy, fuzzy, was a tiger. And is there a moral to the song? asked Queen Cor. Cor, when King Rinkatink had finished his song with great spirit. If there is, replied Rinkatink, it is a warning not to fool with tigers. The little prince could not help smiling at this shrewd answer, but Queen Cor frowned and gave the king a sharp look. Oh, said she, I think I know the difference between a tiger and a lapdog, but I'll bear the warning in mind just the same. For after all her success in capturing them, she was a little afraid of these people who had once displayed such extraordinary powers. And that is the end of chapter 10, The Cunning of Queen Cor. Tomorrow night, I do hope you'll read with me. You'll be here live on Facebook at 8 o'clock with me to read chapter 11. Zella goes to Corygos. Zella being the one with all the magic powers and the magic shoes. And she's going to go to Corygos, which I think bodes well for our heroes. I guess we'll find out tomorrow together right here, 8 o'clock, Facebook live. I hope you'll join us then. I'm, I'm looking right now. I don't know how many chapters are in this. Let me see. 24 chapters. And it's interesting because I don't see. Oh, okay. They do. Uh, apparently, they're going to meet like the regular Oz people in like chapter twenty. So I'm like, I don't see any references like Dorothy or the Wizard or Ozma or nothing. But I guess Dorothy is going to be in like chapter twenty. So eventually, they'll meet the other Oz folks. But for now, we're reading a new adventure with new characters, and I kind of dig this one. This is fun, and they all have good, fun voices to do, and not a ton of them. So I'm enjoying it. I hope you're. I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope you'll be back with us tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, right here for Chapter 11. Good night, everyone.